I once was with one of the top board members. I said, why would you put this much money in Washington when you could have gone to California and all the battles that we have to fight here had already been fought and won and we could just concentrate on making great wine. And he said, the way I look at it is that anybody who looks at we, what we did will think we're crazy. But 20 years from now, they'll wonder where we had the genius. My name is Alan Shoup, and uh, I've been in the wine business for, I think, 37, 38 years. My upbringing, uh, Midwest, Michigan, and got my bachelor's of business administration in Michigan, went on and got a, a master's of, uh, in of psychology at Eastern Michigan, eventually got drafted, sent to the Pentagon, worked as a psychologist, and came out, taught for a while, got a, a job at Amway in Grand Rapids that was just taking off and growing. And I came there right at the perfect time that within a year, I was running the personal care product development group. I became a consumer brands guy, and, and the luck of that was that's what attracted me to Gallo. Because Ernest Gallo saw the parallels between developing fragrances and developing wines. A lot of it is image. Well, when I came in in 1980, the foundation of the Chateau Saint-Michel Wine Organization came from two companies, the American Wine Company and the National Wine Company that merged. And they were the merger of what was once 47 different wineries right after Prohibition. And these two eventually absorbed everything and then they merged. And the wines that they produced without exception were fruit and berry wine, high proof fruit and berry wines. It was 19... 67 when they finally decided that they would like to start really seriously exploring vinifera wine and vinifera grape and that was when the three men bought it from its then group of owners uh, they ended up selling it to u.s tobacco in 1973 the chateau was built in 1976 they started planting more vineyards but the winery was basically known for Johannesburg Riesling. That was probably 80% of our sales when I came into the company. And unfortunately, in 1980, we had had a serious freeze in 79 that destroyed almost two-thirds of the grapes in Washington, and, and a 2,000-acre vineyard of ours had to be replanted from scratch. So the reasons I was brought in is to, you know, to further the growth of the, of the organization kind of sat dormant and it was really difficult because we you know we didn't have enough to sell so we had to start from scratch and uh, the many things that need to be done we needed to build an organization we need to get everybody to work together tell the same story uh, we needed to solve incredibly serious vineyard problems at that time we were just experiencing well all through the 80s we experienced very devastating losses a lot of that had to do with just mistakes that were made, the, the natural mistakes. We planted grapes in the wrong locations, we planted the wrong clones, we planted the wrong varieties. Um, most of the varieties that we have today were planted then, but they were in very, very small quantities. Just before I got there, the Washington State had changed the laws to allow supermarkets to sell wine. People can't appreciate how much that changed. It's suddenly wine, which was bought in most parts of the country in state-owned liquor stores or special, you know, special outlets, and that the woman pushing her shopping cart down the aisle buying bread and butter and things would suddenly see these huge displays of wine. I mean, that that you know, whenever that happened in a state that that happened in, and as as it did happen, wine consumption would would increase, you know, by magnitudes of five or ten times. The retail business, of course, uh, has continued to grow because it's gone from sort of a interest for certain people to go in in taste wines and wine settings to become now it's just uh, you know it competes with things like Disneyland in in, in terms of uh, what people consider fun recreation, uh, and so wine, wineries like. When I own, we sell well over 50% of our wine between retail and, 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 and direct sales. 
Uh, Saint Michel was unique because being the first major winery uh, in Washington, I never liked that the chateau was built in the suburbs of Seattle. I always, I'm, I'm a traditionalist, and I built, believe the wineries should be built in their vineyards. Well, I guess that with a lot of other traditionalist things, you know, uh, shows my age perhaps, because clearly it was a genius thing to do. If you, by building the chateau right next to a major population place and building such a beautiful chateau and such, you know, with wonderful gardens and everything else, we, you know, just brought, it was one of the biggest tourist attractions even back then in all of Seattle. You know, half a million people a year in some instances. In 1985, the, the Chardonnay craze took off, and everybody was drinking Chardonnay. And we didn't have Chardonnay planted. I mean, we had a few acres, but we didn't, you know, very, very little planted. And so to get in the game, we had to start planting Chardonnay. We had to pay growers to pull out their Riesling to plant Chardonnay. We had to do everything we could to get Chardonnay uh, up to a level that, you know, we could compete in that arena. And all during that period, I was giving speeches saying that the future of Washington is red wine. I wasn't sure, but I knew we had to change our image to a red wine producer to really make inroads into the rest of the country and the rest of the world because it's the red wine regions that really establish the great viticulture regions of the world. America was discovering fine wine. They weren't drinking more wine, but they were drinking better wine, which fit our profile perfectly. People don't realize today, but there was a very, very strong anti-alcohol craze going on. We were fighting at the state level and at the federal level, and uh, that's one of the reasons my relationship with Ernest Gallo continued from the time I worked for him. Ernest would call me all the time, and we'd figure out strategies as to how as, as to what was going on more than what we could do about it. But then, then the great miracle happened, which is in 1991. 60 Minutes put on the show called The French Paradox. And as you recall, The French Paradox demonstrated that the French lived longer than the Americans on average, and yet they consumed all this wine and, and other things. And then as they did the research, and the research was, was replicated many times, it was clear that people who consumed moderate amounts of wine lived longer than people who didn't. And uh, Lots of theories as to why that was, but regardless, very difficult now to attack wine as a drug when people drinking it are living longer than people who aren't. And that created this red wine boom, and it was the same time that we had taken a lot of steps internally to enhance our red wine program. We simply benchmarked the entire industry, and. In the process, we checked it in to see what every great red wine winery was doing that we weren't doing, and we adopted all of those techniques. It was a very big investment. We had we, we took our project to the parent company and told them how much we were going to spend and showed them what we were going to do. We did the same thing with Chardonnay. We just switched over everything, built new facilities just just to take advantage of the things that we had learned, put a lot of money into it, and suddenly started making really, really great Chardonnays and great red wines. So early on, we had to first convince our distributors and then key retailers and restaurateurs. So we developed a program whereby we would put five red wines in front of people and in that blind tasting, of course, would be our best representative of Cabernet or, or Bordeaux blend. We'd always have a first growth. We'd then have some of the most famous wines of, of California and maybe a, a you know a high-end third growth or something like that. And and we would do these blind tastings, and invariably our wine would win. And it would just shock everybody. But there's an interesting part of that story, which is that we did this, uh, our parent company had these big mansion retreats in one in, in uh, Palm Springs and one in Watch Hill, and we would bring distributors to one or the other every year. 
And this was in Palm Springs, and we had this area where we did the tasting, and then we brought everybody upstairs to lunch. And I said, grab whatever wines you want, come upstairs, we're gonna have lunch. And so people did, and I got up at the lunch, and, you know, proposed a toast and welcomed everybody. And this was people like Harvey Chapman and, and Wayne Chapman and, you know, the, the biggest people in the industry. And I looked at him and I said, I just have one question. You saw that surprise tasting down there. All of you like the St. Michel Cabernet better than any of the other wines. How many of you brought that up and how many of you brought the Margot up? And of course it was the Margot five to one, including myself. And that's what you fight against. Uh, it's just, it's just what it is, you know. We were washing wine in Washington. I had a hard time, a really difficult time, trying to convince everybody that, because everybody was from Washington, and I convinced him that what Washington means in Washington State is not what it means in the rest of the world. And so I wanted very much to come up with a with an appellation, and I spearheaded the project that created the Columbia Valley. The Columbia Valley today is too big, and it was never intended. It was the two men the two PhDs that put it together, I told them any place we could potentially grow wine grapes, I wanted to be included so that we all use that term, that it became our equivalent of Bordeaux or Burgundy. The reason I worked hard to get the industry to pull in one direction on the same rope is because it was self-evident to me that if, if, if I'm hired to create a world-class winery, by definition, it has to come from a world-class viticultural region. And a world-class viticulture region is not going to have just one member. And so we needed to have all of these wineries making the best wines they could possibly make. For that reason, we, we financed the research, gave it all to everybody. We let them use our labs. We sent winemakers over to help people if they were struggling with their crush. We did everything we could. And my theory was, and I think it was correct, that every good bottle of wine made in Washington helped us as much as, you know, disproportionately helped us, and every bad bottle disproportionately hurt us. That's why I'm quick to give credit to Gary Figgins of Leonetti and Rick Small of Woodward Canyon and Alex Galitzin of Cosita Creek, because those wines they made uh, were the first wines that really got national acclaim. And while we maybe were being recognized as a significant wine company and an important wine company in the kind of mass premium consumer, they were the ones that were really building the awareness that we were a, a industry to be contended with at the topest level. Within a, a few years, uh, you know, we, we, we created the, well, at, in the beginning it was called the Washington Wine Institute, and uh, we financed it and we, you know, brought everybody in. And I think in the beginning, uh, they didn't trust us, and one of the battles I had to fight early on is that they all would want to use that organization to help sell their wines. And it was very difficult for me to explain to them that, no, this organization cannot sell your wines. But what I can do is build a stage and let everybody have equal access to that stage. But the the act that you bring onto that stage, you've got to pay for that act, you've got to, you know, you've got to do the song and dance, you've got to, you know, but you can use the stage. The Washington Wine Institute, when it was created, was simply a, a parallel structure to the California Wine Institute. Eventually, when that various, that and other organizations led to the Wine Commission, we used the name to become the lobbying organization for Washington State. So today, it basically is our lobbying arm probably still almost totally funded by Chateau Saint-Michel. Every other year, we would do these symposiums on a single grape, and then we'd bring people around the world who were makers of wines using that grape. And we had brought Piero Antonori here through that function and others. I said, I'd like to make a proposal to you. And I just told him, I said, I'd like to do what Bob did with Opus One, I'd like to do with you. The difference is, is that I'll pay 100% and I'll give you 25% of 
we'll take the costs of that out of the profits, but you'll not invest a dime, and you'll have the right to buy the other 25%. So Piro looked at me, we were in my office at the point, he said, well, this, this sounds interesting. He says, I, uh, uh, I will talk to Renzel and, and we will come back and look at the vineyards and, and, and see. So they did, they, they came back. And he and Renzel, I think, came in on Monday and they went over to Eastern Washington. We, at that time, had probably 50,000 barrels of red wine that they could investigate and and looked at the vineyards and came back, I think, like on a Thursday in my office. And he sits down and looks at me and says, well, why not? Let's do this. He um, said, I think we should work with Syrah at Cabernet. And, um, so, of course, the rest is history. We created Coast Solari. One of the points I should make, though, is that there are certain men in this industry, like Bob Mondavi and, and Piero Antonori, Gustin Hineas, that are these wise old souls of the industry and very, very special people who, from my perspective, uh, they're, they're the soul of the industry, and, and they uh, would have done this had they gone broke. They did it for love and passion, and, and really didn't do it so much for financial gain. And as an example of that, when Piero agreed that we were going to do this, I said, how should we start? Uh, I said, you have lawyers. You can write an agreement. I have lawyers. I can write an agreement, or if you want. I have this very thick document that I worked with with Maida Lankasing, and it definitely includes everything that conceivably needs to be included. And he said, well, you have that. We start with that, and I, I'll look at that, and I will call you. And he called me within a week. And he said, well, it's a very good document. I think there are only three problems. And I went, I'm gonna go through this again. And he says, but I don't think you will mind because they are all for your benefit. And they were. He saw things where we were too generous. And I just said, boy, I hope if I ever am in a similar opportunity that I find things like that in a contract because what a way to set out on an on a agreement than for somebody to give you back something that you gave them. And right on the heels of that, uh, our in-house attorney got a call from a man that I didn't know anything about at the time, Ernie Lucen, who said that he wanted to come and talk about a joint venture. Bob Betts, who knew who he was, said, well, he's got a very significant winery. He's kind of Mr. Riesling. I didn't know that much about German Rieslings, and so I said, fine, let's meet him. And so I brought him in, and he sat down with me, and he said, uh, I believe there's going to be a renaissance in Riesling. And I offered him effectively the same deal that I after offered uh, Piero. And overnight, we sold 22,000 cases at $23 a bottle and, and ran out. And so that was a unique success. Longshuttles is simply an attempt to bring the finest grapes in Washington to those winemakers who are known to make the finest wines with those grapes and see what that collaboration can bring forth. Well, Long Shadows, of course, was my plan before I left of what I was gonna do to, you know, work out through my re retirement. Uh, I came up with the name because I knew I was gonna bring people into it who had cast long shadows on the industry. I put in a substantial amount of my money, uh, about a third of the total investment, and that helped get investors because they like to see somebody putting their own money at risk. And I managed to keep 67% uh, well, of the stock in the company. But uh, yeah, it was, it was, green grass. I mean, there was there was no facility. I didn't even know where I was going to build a facility. I didn't know who the winemaker, full-time winemaker, was going to be. Um, as I look back now, 
it was much more ambitious than it felt at the time. At the time, it honestly felt to me like a no-brainer. And uh, today I realize it was, you know, a lot of risk. The winemakers were all concerned about who was this person gonna be that was over, gonna oversee the entire operation. And, and uh, I said, you know, I don't know right now, but I hope each of you will come up with ideas and I just think the right person's gonna come to us. And sure enough, it wasn't two weeks later that Jill Nicole, who was the winemaker at Woodward Canyon, trained in France, called me and said, this is my dream job. It didn't take six months before his relationship with each of the, the as, as we call them, celebrity winemakers, uh, became so close and so respectful that after the first vintage, uh, they were all saying that they believed that he was as important as they were to make the wine, that they didn't instruct him, they collaborated with him. Quite interestingly, when I, when I was presenting the business plan, I referred to the business as that each of these wine, that what I was going to build was an incubator, and that each of these wines that would be made would eventually be brought out of the incubator and given their own wine facility. And that's still a vision I have. Like most wineries uh, in Washington, we sourced all our fruit in the beginning, and then there was a a vineyard that I had always coveted that uh, I called the Benches, a very, one of the most unique vineyards really in the world. And, and so with uh, a small group, uh, uh, including Augustin Henaeus, uh, I bought that vineyard. And then we started trying to use that vineyard for most of the wines. Uh, that was working pretty well, but owning the vineyard became problematic and it was uh, such a big investment that eventually I did sell the vineyard. I have retained uh, the contractual rights to some of the most important vineyards within it, but I no longer own them. What I explain to people is that you really need to look at the site and look at it with a great deal of detail. You shouldn't buy a site that didn't have weather stations on it so you really know the range of temperature and you need to dig holes in it to know the depths and types of, of soil and rock. And it just, my belief is that you almost, and this is why I tell people, you can't pay too little for bad land or too much for good land. And to put a, a vineyard on average to less than average land is just, is, is just foolhardy. And a lot of people will put a vineyard on a piece of land only because they own it, not because of any other reason. They just, or it looks pretty, or it's next to their property. <laughs> the exit probably wasn't necessary in the hindsight, but the vineyards have always scared me because unlike 99% of the people in Washington, they didn't go through what I went through in the 80s. They didn't see that devastation that happens uh, when you lose 50% of your grapes. Ironically, since 2000 to today, 17 years, we haven't had one of those. We just haven't had it. But to think it won't happen is to, is, is to be naive. These current uh, extreme winters that we've had in, in, the, in the Northeast were caused because the jet stream came down more to the middle of the country where it used to come down often right through Washington. If that those jet streams had come down through us, our, our vines weren't hardened off, they would not have survived those winters. And uh, you know, that's, that's the facts. Nobody, maybe anywhere, has produced six different reds with the collective success of scores. We, last year, we made a couple of reserve wines, three or four reserve wines. I have my own wine now called Shoop that I just make 100 cases of, a very rare wine. And uh, Gilles now, I let him make a wine for himself. And the scores of, I think there were 12 reds in Parker's last uh, review, and the average score was 94 points. So 12 reds, that's pretty good. And the lowest in that would have been a 90 or a 91. Price points is a pretty sensitive issue because I've got a couple of board members who are 
it, it's almost fair to say irate over the fact that we don't sell at higher prices. Um, we, we still want broader distribution. And even though we run out every year, uh, we have no problem selling direct and our direct sales grow, uh, but we don't have a sales force. And that's probably uh, an indictment of me. It's probably a mistake I'm making because we, we don't have good distributor contact and therefore uh, there are many markets where we're very, very hard to find. And obviously if we raise prices, it would be even harder to find. So we wanna be on fine wine lists. And when you get up to that $100 point, you're selling for $250, $300 on a wine list. You're not selling a lot of wine. It's the world's most competitive industry. There are more people making a wine product, maybe a half a million, each one wanting to be on that famous wine list at Le Cirque or wherever. And uh, so it, it's just hi highly competitive and so very, very difficult. On the other hand, the world's changing rapidly. And to say that there's not room to bring things full circle, to say that there's not room for a young winemaker to make a statement would be to say there's not room for a young artist to make a statement. Thank you.